Hello everyone, my name is Dr. Ablino de Costa and in this video I will be talking about some other types of genotoxicity and mutagenicity tests. In the previous two videos I spoke about uh, some other genotoxicity and mutagenicity tests, particularly those which are done in bacteria like the AIMS test and the reverse uh, bacterial assay and certain in vitro mammalian models uh, such as the mouse lymphoma assay, the HPRP assay, the sister chromatid exchange etc. In this video, I'll be talking about uh, some more advanced uh, techniques which are used for testing genotoxicity. Uh, so the first one is the chromosomal aberration test in which we can, uh, we can perform this particular test in cells which are dividing and we are able to identify certain types of uh, aberrations which can be visualized with the help of a microscope. So you can see over here certain aberrations which can be visualized like uh, dicentric chromosomes that are chromosomes having two centromeres which have uh, occurred because of certain breaks between two or uh, more chromosomes and that has resulted in the fusion of these chromosomes and you can see the presence of two, dicent uh, two centromeres on a single chromosome that appears as a single chromosome. Then we can have phys uh, visible breaks in the chromosomes, gaps would be the breaks which are involving uh, both the strands of the uh, both the arms of the chromosome then we can have the ring chromosome i've already explained all of these uh, types of damages in my uh, previous videos where i spoke about uh, different uh, types of chromosomal damage and dna damage and uh, here in this one you can see a metaphase plate where there's extra chromosomes in the uh, metaphase spread so if we, when we do this particular test we are able to see different types of chromosomal aberrations and this is a very good test to actually see if a particular substance or a, a compound is causing any type of ca uh, clastogenicity that is damage to the chromosomes. So in order to do this test we can culture certain cells, we, most, we usually culture the human lymphocytes and we can uh, then uh, stimulate them to divide. So before stimulating them to divide we can uh, uh, expose the lymphocytes in culture to the toxicant that we want to test and then we can uh, stimulate the cells to divide using a mitogen. So a mitogen is a compound which is going to be used to stimulate the cells to come out of interphase and enter into the uh, enter into the mitotic phase. So we use a mitogen like phytohemagglutinin, uh, abbreviated as PHA, which stimulates uh, cell division. Uh, so when the cell is undergoing cell division, we want to basically condense the chromosomes so that they can be visualized and uh, which cannot be done if it's if the chromosome is an in interphase stage so we stimulate it to divide and then we want to arrest the chromosomes at the phase of meta at the stage of metaphase because we don't want it to further undergo uh, anaphase and telophase then we would not be able to see the chromosomes very very clearly so we use a spindle inhibitor that another it's another compound which is, which is referred to as colchicine where we arrest the cell division cycle at metaphase. So we do not allow the spindle fiber or the spindle apparatus to form and therefore the cells do not then uh, uh, undergo further cell division. They, they stop the process of cell division at metaphase. And then there is other treatment which is going to be done to the cells. So this is another, uh, this is a, the other part of the, uh, the test where we then treat the cells with a hypotonic solution. Usually we give a, a, a salt solution which is of low concentration such that water enters into the cells and makes the uh, cells uh, swell to a large size. So why we do this is because we want to burst open the cell. We want to burst open the cell such that the chromosomes can uh, come out of the cell and they can be nicely spread on the slide. So what we do is we, we swell the cells, we make the cells swell using a hypotonic solution and then we take this uh, uh, solution and we treat it. We then we treat it with a fixative uh, using uh, acetic acid and methanol. We wash the cells a few times and then after that we physically drop these cells onto a slide. So we take the solution in a pasture pipette or in any dropper or anything of that sort and we uh, drop the cells at a height of about one foot onto a chilled slide. Okay, the chilled slide will help uh, in uh, allowing the chromosomes to adhere uh, to the slide and once this particular drop of uh, suspension is dropped onto the slide, the cells burst and thereby allowing the chromosomes to be liberated out from the uh, nucleus and from the cell. And then quickly we pass this slide through a, 
uh, flame and uh, with the rapid heating and cooling this allows the uh, the chromosome arms to spread nicely onto the slide and then uh, we will stain it with the uh, gimsa which is a nuclear stain which stains the chromosomes a deep purple color and then we wash off the excess stain and then we air dry it and then observe it under the microscope for any types of aberration so we can actually see the chromosomal uh, metaphase plates and then we can then uh, observe it under a little bit of a higher power magnification that is under maybe 100x uh, of the mi uh, microscope and then we can actually visualize the metaphase chromosomes which look like this so we can actually then count the number of chromosomes if they are human chromosomes obviously the number of chromosomes needs to be 46 so we need to count and see whether there are 46 chromosomes in these metaphase plates or there may be more chromosomes there may be less chromosomes uh, so that can indicate some type of a damage any kind of breaks which are looking like this ring chromosome formation so many things we can observe uh, with the help of the metaphase plate the next test we can talk about is the cytokinesis block micronucleus test where uh, uh, it is uh, it is again uh, somewhat similar to the uh, chromosomal aberration test in the sense that we are going to see for any type of uh, chromosomal damage being done to the cells so uh, what is the micronucleus test do it shows us if any chromosome is not being incorporated into the uh, daughter cells during mitosis or if any fragment of a chromosome has broken off and is not getting incorporated into the daughter cell. So breaking off, that is the breaks which are occurring or you know the some problem where the chromosome is not able to be uh, properly segregated into the daughter cells, they can remain out of mitosis as you know a separate entity which we refer to as the micronucleus. So uh, what causes the formation of micronucleus again is the substances which can cause some type of chromosomal damage and there are a number of chemicals which can do this. So when we see a large number of these micronuclei in cells, we can say that the, the compound has caused some type of a clastrogenic event or a genotoxic event that has caused the formation of the micronucleus, which is nothing but breaking a broken portion or a whole chromosome, which has not been incorporated into the daughter cells during mitosis. So we can again use uh, the human lymphocytes to study the chromosomal uh, damage. And in this, what we do is we again culture, we can culture any type of cells actually, but uh, we mostly culture the lymphocytes and uh, then we can uh, stimulate them to divide again by using this compound that is PHA. And then uh, where in chromosomal aberration test, we are using uh, colchicine. Uh, here in this, we are using a cytokinesis inhibitor, which means what we are allowing the cells to pass through metaphase. So they go through anaphase and telophase. So we get the formation of uh, the two separate uh, nuclei of the daughter cells, but then we do not allow cytokinesis to, to take place. That is, we do not allow the cells to physically divide. So we use another compound over here, which is referred to as cytocalcin D, which does not allow the cell to divide. And this results in the formation of binucleated cells. So this is nothing but the telophase, uh, telophase which has taken place, but without the separation of the two cells. Okay. And so then we can easily visualize uh, the, the chromosome or the fragment which has not gotten incorporated into any of these daughter cells and which is remaining out of the two nuclei as a separate entity which we refer to as micronucleus. So under normal circumstances you will not get the formation of micronucleus because uh, the cells will be healthy, uh, the nuclei will be intact, uh, the DNA will be intact, the chromosomes will be intact, so you will not get this. So only if the cells are exposed to some type of a uh, toxicant, genotoxicant or you know mutagenic substance where you will be able to get this formation of the micronucleus and this can be easily visualized uh, so uh, we can count the number of micronuclei per 2000 cells and then we can estimate whether in, whether in fact uh, a DNA damage has occurred because of a, of a genotoxic substance or not. And the next test is the uh, single cell gel electrophoresis assay which is referred to as a comet assay it is a slightly complicated procedure in the sense that it has many steps but if it's done properly you can get uh, you can get uh, very good results from this so in this what is done is that uh, cells can be cultured uh, or you can even take the cells from uh, a live specimen that is a mouse or any other organism for that matter and uh, if you're taking it from the cell culture you're obviously going to expose the cells to the toxicant and then you're going to take these cells and you're going to uh, basically lyse the entire cell. So the cell, you're going to lyse the cell means you're going to disrupt, you're going to degrade the cell membrane, uh, the, 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 uh, the cytoplasm, the nuclear membrane, everything. Okay, what we're going to re uh, leave back is just the DNA, just the DNA. Okay, so there's a process of cell lysis where we degrade the entire cellular contents except the nucleus. And then after that, 
we subject this. Uh, so what we do is we we put these cells on a slide, uh, and uh, the cells are put in such a way that they will be embedded on the slide. So we usually use a gel like agarose. We use a gel and we embed the cells in agarose and we make a smear on a slide. Okay, so the cells are going to be fixed on the slide with the help of the agarose. And then we insert the slide in a lysis buffer where we degrade the cellular components. And after lysis, so lysis is usually done for about uh, 12 to 24 hours. And after lysis, then we, we subject the, uh, the slides to electrophoresis. Okay, so why we do electrophoresis is that if in case there are any kind of DNA strand breaks which are uh, there in the nucleus as a result of exposure to a, a toxic compound, these single strand breaks or these broken fragments of DNA start to migrate out of these nuclei. They start to migrate out of this nuclei. So only if there are DNA strand breaks. If there are no DNA strand breaks, then you will not get uh, any kind of migration of these uh, single strand fra fragments moving out of the nucleus. But if there are a lot of fragments, uh, fragmented DNA that is uh, caused because of uh, exposure to some uh, toxic agent, then you will get the formation of, uh, you know, uh, the tails basic so these tails are nothing but the migrated dna fragments which are migrated out of the cell so you see the importance of lysis of the cell so we are just retaining only the nucleus and then we're subjecting the cells to electrophoresis so under the influence of electrophoresis as you know dna is negatively charged it will move to the positive electrode under the influence of electric field but if the dna is intact uh, it will not move in this way okay it will not because these are small small tiny tiny fragments so they are easily able to move through the pores of the agarose and create a sort of like a tail like structure uh, outside the uh, nucleus so you can see what the tail looks like so you can see it looks like a comet so that's why it's referred to as a comet a comet is a shooting star okay so you can see how this uh, tail has been formed these this cloud which you can see over here is nothing but the uh, the fragmented dna which has migrated out of the nucleus and how this fragmented dna has come because of the exposure to certain chemicals so you can see uh, dna which is not going to be fragmented which does not have any fragments or if it's exposed to a compound which is not genotoxic you will not get the formation of a tail okay so longer the tail uh, it is directly proportional to the uh, to the uh, to the concentration of the genotoxic substance okay so higher the concentration of the genotoxic substance you will get a longer Tail. okay so sometimes the tail becomes even longer than this and then you can actually see a very long comet being formed so we can actually measure the length of the tail and then we can uh, we can ca we can do a calculation which is referred to as a percentage tail dna so uh, uh, higher the percentage tail dna it will indicate more uh, damage which is being done to the dna so this test is a bit of a complicated test because it requires a number of chemicals and uh, you require to use a uh, fluorescent dye to visualize these cells. We use ethidium bromide to visualize the cells and then we uh, observe these slides under a fluorescence microscope. So that is why we get uh, such uh, images on a dark background where the cells are going to be fluoresced. Okay, so you get a fluorescent uh, color of the cells and uh, they give, you know, can have different colors like depending on the filter that you're using, you can have them in red color, yellow color, green color, blue color, etc. And uh, this last part is the in vivo test. It is actually the same things which can be done in an animal model. So the chromosomal aberration test, the micronucleus test and the uh, comet assay, they can also be done in animal models. We can use an experimental animal like mice or fish or uh, any other organism for that matter. And we can actually expose them to different uh, compounds, different concentrations and different time intervals. And then we can collect samples from them directly. So we don't need to culture any cells. We're directly taking it from the organism by exposing it to the organism. This gives us a real-time uh, interpretation of uh, the uh, uh, genotoxic effects of certain compounds because we are directly exposing it to an organism. And then we are seeing how this particular substance is getting taken up by the organism and whether indeed it is causing genotoxicity or not. So in in vitro systems, what happens, it becomes a little bit different because it is not exactly the animal that we are studying, we are directly exposing it to the cells. When we do in vivo tests, it is a bit more advantageous because, you know, sometimes a, a genotoxic uh, compound may get transformed into other metabolites and then whether those metabolites are causing damage to different parts of the body or they may be getting excreted out of the body, that can be seen. So we can always compare in vitro tests and in vivo tests and we may also get some slightly different results from them. Okay, so the same things can be done. Uh, in in vivo condition, the same test can be done. Uh, we don't need to stimulate cell division as such uh, in these cells. We can directly take the cells. Uh, we usually take the bone marrow cells or uh, the blood cells. In case of a fish, the fish have a, my, uh, have a nucleus in their uh, 
uh, in their cells, whereas uh, the red blood cells of mammals don't have a nucleus. So we can mostly use the white blood cells in this case. Uh, but for uh, mammals like mice and all, we use the bone marrow because in the bone marrow, there are a lot of rapidly dividing cells. And we can use these cells then for uh, doing the chromosomal aberration test, the micronucleus test and the comet assay where we will get the similar results as we saw in the in vitro test. Thank you.